This is Ray Stokes in the oral history section of TCOM's Health Science Library in Fort Worth. However, we're not in Fort Worth today. We have the pleasure of being in the state's great capital of Austin. And we have the great pleasure of being in the office of a very dear friend of mine and a longtime professional osteopathic physician here in the city, Dr. Elmer Baum. I believe it's Elmer J. Elmer C. Elmer C. I knew I'd make a mistake, but Elmer C. Yeah. Baum, uh, who's been here in Austin now since the middle 40s. Uh, Dr. Elmer, we're in your office today, and it's a great delight to have the pleasure just to sit down and visit with you and kind of pick your brain on what you know about this great profession. And a little bit, I know you're going to say you're very modest, but I know you've had a little finger in this big hand of the success that the profession has had since uh, the middle 40s. So, once again, it's a pleasure to be here with you. Let's start from, well, not necessarily the very beginning, but when did you get out of uh, college? Where did you go to uh, osteopathic went, school? I went to Kansas City College of Osteopathic uh, uh, Medicine and Surgery. Mm -hmm. And when did you finish? 1935. All right, what'd you do after you left there? Well, I was coming to Texas. I took the medical board down here, and I was coming to Texas, and my wife's folks lived up there in Kansas, and they persuaded us to locate up there, so I located in Uniontown, Kansas. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, you finally made it to Texas, but why, why were you directed to Texas in the first place? Oh, I liked Austin. I just I liked it. Oh, you've been town. here before? Yes, yeah, I mm -hmm. took the medical board here. I see, I see. All right. And yeah. you fell in love with it when you came down here? Oh, today? yeah, I liked it. And it had a university here and had everything that I wanted. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just liked the place. Now, you were detoured into where in Kansas? Uh, Uniontown. Uniontown. Mm -hmm. what, what happened there? Well, I practiced, I covered for three different towns, had no doctors, mm -hmm. and I was gone. Now, where is Uniontown located? It's south of Kansas City, about mm -hmm. 100 miles. I see. Is and it still a pretty good community? Well, it's a small community. You know, small communities have all, all gone down in, in their size compared to what they were. But that time, I had Uniontown, had two other towns that I had to take care of, and mm -hmm. uh, I was busy, busy delivering a lot of babies, right, a lot right. of babies. and. And, uh, in other words, you were in, of course, you called it, I guess, general practice. Oh, yeah. And incidentally, you are a fellow in the American College of General Practitioners. That's correct. That's correct. Uh, and then certified in, in, in general practice. Right. Uh, but excuse me, I'll go back to your uh, Union City practice. So I stayed there seven years, and then I moved down here to Austin. And uh, Well, that would make it then about 42, 43? Yeah, about 43, I believe mm -hmm. it was, somewhere along in there. Yeah. And... Uh, I started in practice here, and uh, uh, I've enjoyed being here very much. Mm -hmm. How did you, uh, when, have you been in this same location all that time, or uh, how I've many been practice this, offices have you had here? I built this office in about 1948. 1948, now we're at 908 New Aces, yeah. which is not very far from the capital. That's right, about uh, four or five blocks. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, tell me how, of course, in building your, your, your practice, uh, can you give me a, a little of an idea about how you became acquainted with some of our state uh, statesmen and politicians? Well, I've always been interested in politics. I served as mayor of the little town. Now, I knew Uniontown. you had mentioned that to me, so let's go back to and, Uniontown. Uh, how long I, were you the mayor there? I was mayor about uh, six years. Six years? Well, you and weren't there seven. You did a pretty that, good job. That wasn't any big accomplishment, <laughs> you know. Anyway, uh, so I've always been interested in politics, and when I moved down here, I got acquainted with the first, probably the first person of any stature was Jesse James. He was state treasurer. Yes, sir. Yes, and uh, he was real kind to me. He took, he kind of took me over and... How did you get acquainted with him? Well, I don't recall. I think he came to me or his wife did. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And from then on, while well, we were close friends and uh, he helped me along. And, and then, uh, then the 1950s, you know, Governor Shivers uh, was governor. Right. And he was real, How real good. How many terms did he serve? He served uh, uh, three and a half terms. Well, that's what I was I knew it was more yeah. than two. Three and a half terms, yeah. Uh, well, uh, but your connection that you had, to, or your first statesman, I don't like to say politician for some people, particularly if they're dead, they're statesmen, yeah. uh, and Jesse James, uh, he, he was influential in helping you, I'm oh, sure, yeah, establish yeah, he, yourself. I would go to various functions with him, you mm -hmm. know, and he would introduce me at state functions. In other words, without it sounding at all demeaning, he was kind of an uh, uh, an entree for you into other yeah. pursuits. 
And then also, I was precinct chairman in my neighborhood out there. For okay, now, what party for, was that, Doctor? What, what uh, Democratic said, Party? <laughs> right. yeah. In those days, that's about what thought, it was. I thought you said what party. <laughs> but anyway, I was uh, precinct chairman, which you have to be elected, you know, every right. two years. Right. And I was precinct chairman out there, I think, for 24 years, and then resigned. Resigned when I, when I became state Democratic chairman. Mm -hmm. State Democratic chairman? Mm -hmm. What year? 19... Uh, be 1968. Uh, well, okay, then uh, state Democratic chairman. That's a, an honor and distinction I really wasn't aware of, and uh, that's something to be very proud of. So that naturally has kept you close to uh, even up to the current political yeah. scheme today. Uh, I understand you've uh, been a physician of uh, a number of uh, our state officials. Uh, can you name some of the other lieutenant governors and governors and state officers that you've had the pleasure to, uh, shall I say, I've, uh, treat? I've, I've met them. I met them all, from, at least from the period from 1950 on up to 1975. Mm -hmm. I would say, uh, well, every uh, lieutenant governor has been in my office since 1950, up to now. Up to now. Mm -hmm. And. Uh, Every governor from 1950 to 75 has been in my office, mm -hmm. and uh, as well as the speaker and other state officials. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, I don't want to be uh, aggrandizing myself, but uh, and one day, right. you one day, it. you know, one day here in my office, uh, I had the present governor and two former governors and five Supreme Court judges in my office in one day. That, that'll never happen again, you know. I kind of go over that again, kind of slowly, because that's history itself. Now. You shouldn't have pulled me out on that. <laughs> you uh, said how many? Uh, well, I had the, had the present governor and two former governors. Mm -hmm. Well, who was I, the present governor, you recall? Uh, I guess it was Governor Smith. Governor Preston Smith. Yes. Mm -hmm. and, well, now, you uh, were his private physician at yeah, one time, and had, weren't you? And Governor Shivers and Governor Daniel. They were both in here and five Supreme Court judges. Five Supreme Court judges. All in one day. Tell me something, what, uh, what was your relationship to the governor, John Conley, particularly when he was injured uh, during that tragic November day? Uh, we were just uh, good personal friends. Uh, I've, uh, he has not been in my office, but we've been always good personal friends. Mm -hmm. But you never did, you never no. was his position? No. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Anything particular that you remember that occurred during that time that uh, has some impact upon your life or? Well, I remember clearly when it happened because I was going to Washington mm -hmm. that day and I heard on the radio about Kennedy being shot, right. President Kennedy being shot. And gosh, I just even hated to go, hated to go to Washington because this happened in Texas, you know. Mm -hmm. It just, uh, but I did go and it's uh, real, real sad, real sad. Fair. Because Kennedy was coming down here for dinner, we were having a, we were going to have a big dinner for him down here that night. Oh, that, he would have been here that yes, night that yes, he was killed yes. in Dallas mm -hmm. at noon. I see. Mm -hmm. So you were making that. Not, were you the? Well, you weren't the no, chairman of the Democratic that. Party, no. but you were, no. I'm sure, an official. Yes. Yeah, right. Well, um, then. Um, you are, have been very close, and you mentioned a moment ago that you were the, the private physician of, of Dr. Preston Smith. Now, he's going to enter into our picture a little bit more. Of course, you mentioned that. I, I didn't mention that because I don't like to say that anybody is, but I'm just saying that they were in my office. I understand. Yes, and I, I did take care of Governor Smith when yeah. uh, he had a problem, and uh, this came, came up in the legislature. Right. He had a problem, and he, I had to take him to the hospital right. during the night. And... Um, then later on, it was brought up in the legislature, I think a couple of years later, that here his own private doctor couldn't work in that hospital, you know. Yeah. Remember that? Yes, sir. I wanted to, that's what I was trying to allude to at, the, at that time. Yeah. What year was that? Do you recall? Uh, that must have been in the, uh, it would have to be in the late 60s or mm -hmm. early 70s, probably the late 60s. Yeah, right, right. Well, I'm, let's go back just a little bit. I know you have a, 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 a an avid interest uh, in uh, the, the history of, of the osteopathic profession, particularly the, uh, the profession here in Texas, uh, and the association, I believe, was founded in 1900. Uh, long about 1907, didn't the, didn't, the, didn't the profession have a little trouble with the legislature? 
Were there certain bills enacted that uh, uh, may not have been too uh, advantageous? Of course, I wasn't here then, but in the no. history of it is, and I've studied. I don't think you and I either one were here in 1907. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, the history of is uh, real good. The, the, the practice of medicine has an industry hist history test in Texas as to the licensure and the development of the osteopathic profession. Mm -hmm. Because back in 18, that's over a century ago, in 1873, uh, the doctors were licensed in each county. They had mm -hmm. a board in each county, and then it went to district. That's the history of it. Right. Then we come to 1907, is what you mentioned. Uh -huh. Uh, is when the legislature said, well, here we got four schools of medicine. We've got the homeopaths, eclectics, allopaths, and the osteopaths. Mm -hmm. Four schools of medicine and four standards. Now, that's 1907. 1907. Mm -hmm. And the legislature said, why don't we just have one school and one board for all those practitioners of medicine? And uh, so that's what came about. And we still have the same practice, the uh, same uh, law as we did then, although it's been amended a time or two. But you know, it's a peculiar thing. You, you bring that up and then, then we go on. A few years later, after the Texas Board of Medical Examiners uh, was established in 1907, we had some uh, DOs that were claiming and said, well, now I'm not practicing medicine, I'm practicing osteopathy. I don't want to come under this board, see? Uh -huh. I didn't want to come under that board. There were several. Well, of course, that, that passed away, you know, that went on. Another interesting part of the history, Phil Russell could, uh, could have told you about that, and maybe he has. Uh, when they had the medical board was meeting, meeting down here, and they were going to give medical examinations here in Austin. And um, so a couple of members of the medical board, MDs, Went to the courthouse here in uh, Travis County, which the courthouse is right one block away from here. Now, what year are we talking? Uh, we're talking in the 30s. In the 30s. Yeah, the late 30s. Uh huh. And uh, they wanted to uh, enjoin everybody that was not a graduate of a Class A medical school from taking the examination. Mm -hmm. That was just the day before examination. They went to the judge up here, and the judge apparently accepted. It, so the DO was heard about it. And to show you again, when you treat people osteopathically, when you treat people uh, of stature in a community, then you can have, then you'll have some contacts. Mm -hmm. right. uh, this individual has got the individual they got. They had had influence. Well, the individual they got to uh, to defend them was a, a man was a former attorney general and a former governor, Governor Dan Moody. They got him to do it. He had no connection with osteopathy at all. He was just an individual who wanted to do what was right, and a friend of his called him and asked him if he would help the DOs out. So he went to the courthouse, and he got a stay on that. In other words, a stay of order, of the court order, so that uh, these students could go ahead and take the medical examination. Well, the problem resolved itself after that, but uh, those are some of the things that just did come up, you know. Mm -hmm. And it's been a battle, been a battle all the way through. We had to fight for everything, you know. Right, right. We had trouble with insurance companies in the 40s. We had trouble with state agencies. We had trouble with um, getting postgraduate medical training in the uh, 50s and 60s. Mm -hmm. So we've had problems. We had to work. And the reason we were successful and moving up all the time because we were treating people of influence. Mm -hmm. And we had something distinctive, something a little different to offer. Why would they come, uh, come to us in the first place? Because we were, for only one reason, that is, we were a little different. Because mm -hmm. they could go to any doctor, but they came to us because we gave OMTs. Mm -hmm. OMT now, what does that mean? That's osteopathic manipulative treatment. Right. We used to call it an osteopathic treatment. Mm -hmm. Uh, Dr. Elmer, you mentioned a moment ago about uh, one of the great uh, uh, physicians in osteopathy here, particularly in Texas. I think he was referred to as the Dean of Texas Osteopathy at one time, Phil Russell. Uh, what was your contact with uh, with Dr. Phil? Oh, very close, very close. He'd, he'd call me every day, you know. Mm -hmm. I was down here in Austin. So right, he right. You were kind of a pipeline for him. Yeah, right? I was uh, in the legislature, and yeah. of course, uh, he would call me about various things, you know, and I would do the leg work for him, you know. Right. And uh, we worked very closely together, and 
Phil was great. You know, he treated people of stature and influence. Right. Eamon Carter, for yes, example, he and treated, Sid Richardson. You bet. And that made a difference. It that sure made did. a difference. Yeah. Yeah. That made a difference how we came along. That's what I'm trying to say is that uh, it's because we had certain people that were treating people of position, which made a big difference. Besides, we had all these DOs that were treating uh, people out in rural area where nobody else was going but the DOs. Mm -hmm. But Phil and I were served on the, the legislative committee for many, many years. Uh, we had a very close relationship. Now that'd uh, be the your association's legislative yes, committee, yes. Thomas legislative yes, committee. Yes, yes. Right. He was chairman up until oh, I guess uh, mid fifties maybe, and I was chairman from then on. Mm -hmm. But we always worked very closely together. Uh, what? Uh, let's go back to your your initial interest in helping establish a Texas College of Osteopathic Medicine. Of course, at that time, you didn't know exactly where it'd be located or anything of that nature, but long, you were president of Toma in what, 52, 53? 52. Was there any interest manifested at that far back date uh, of a proposed school? I, uh, I think they dated 1960, but I just wondered if, the, if there was a little uh, germ planted earlier, maybe during your administration. Not really. We really never thought about a college uh, in the 50s that much. Uh, really, our profession, I think, uh, there's a lot of credit goes a long ways back, but going to the 50s, you know, when uh, under the Governor Shiver's administration, which I mentioned a mm -hmm. while ago, he right. opened a lot of doors for us. And he put uh, he put DOs on a lot of different advisory committees that were helpful. Well, I was going to ask you could you name one of those doors yeah, particularly? Yeah, and resolving uh, in resolving uh, problems we had with state agencies, and um, like insurance, for example. Yes, and mm -hmm. like even Blue Cross Blue Shield, which you wouldn't think would be doing that, but they would deny payments to osteopathic doctors because they weren't a graduate of a Class A medical school mm -hmm. or some other arbitrary uh, regulation. Right. But anyway, he helped us then. And then uh, Governor Smith came along. He served in the House for six years. He served in the Senate for six years. He ser served as Lieutenant Governor six years. And as Governor of, uh, for four years. In 1963, we were talking about, uh, talking about colleges. Uh, we, we thought about mainly about getting funding first, Ray, mm -hmm. uh, for students who were going out of state to study. Yeah, that's, I'm you're getting into a subject now yeah. that I wanted you yeah. to touch on. To study in osteopathic colleges. So, well, what prompted your decision to make what, that attempt? This this came about this way. Uh, governor Smith was lieutenant governor then, mm -hmm. and we were talking, and we were we were very good friends, and uh, he was strong for our profession. I told him, I says, uh, Governor, you know, I said, we've got, we've got students going out of state, going to osteopathic colleges, and then they come back and they go to a rural area, and I said, they go, they fulfill a real need, something that's uh, really vital to the state and really worth something, and I said, something <coughs> ought to be done. I mentioned that to him uh, just during, the, towards the end of the session, when the budget and the Finance Committee had pretty well finalized all their appropriation. And uh, we visited about it that afternoon, or that evening was, and he says, well, let's go down and see the Chairman of the Appropriations Committee in the morning. Mm -hmm. I says, all right. So we went down and saw the Chairman of the Appropriations Committee, who was Darcy Hardiman of uh, San Angelo. We told him uh, essentially the same thing that I told you, that mm -hmm. these students are going out of state to, uh, to Osteopathic College, and then they come back, and feel a great need in rural areas. Most of them uh, went to lo located in rural, rural areas. And uh, they ought to have some help. We ought to have some funding or some scholarships or something. Well, he mentioned to me, he says, now, we're near the end of the, we finalized the budget, and uh, uh, he says, how much money are you talking about? And I said, well, hadn't thought about that too much, but I knew once if we got a scholarship, I knew once we did, we wouldn't have any trouble adding on to that easily. Right. They had to set the precedent. So I said, what about $10,000? That was in 1963. 63. And uh, he said, well, I think maybe we can work that out. But anyway, we left, Governor Smith and I left to sure that we'd taken care of, which it was. Mm -hmm. So uh, 
I came back to the Public Health Committee and told them that, that we've, uh, we've got this money now and how, how do you all want to do it? So we, we decided on having eight scholarships, $600, six scholarships at $800 each. And uh, so to select these students, we uh, had publicized it in the journal and, and otherwise, and we told them that uh, they'd have to uh, designate and, 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 and justify the need, plus we wanted a letter from their representative and senator and other uh, officials in their area. Mm -hmm. So the next time the session met, the representative and senator be, would be aware of it and would be for it. He'd be on our side, see? Right, right. Dr. Baum, you've done fine on bringing us up to date to about 1971. Now, uh, what was your involvement? And I know you were greatly concerned, because 1971 there was a Texas College of Osteopathic Medicine having been founded, uh, uh, or opened, it was founded in 66, but we finally got able to get enough funds together to, on a shoestring operation, so to speak, on the fifth floor of the mm -hmm. Osteopathic Hospital there in Fort Worth, we, we opened the doors on the 1st of October, 1970. But I'm sure there was a great deal of assistance that you gave to Dr. Lubel and some of the other founders of the school in helping us acquire more state money. And that $100,000 that you were getting at that time for scholarship purposes for to train students outside of the state because we didn't have an osteopathic mm -hmm. college was a sort of an entree into helping get more than what we already had. Mm -hmm. And I know you were greatly involved in that. Uh, what happened along about 1971 that made it possible for, shall we say, Senate Bill 160? Can you tell us a little bit about that bill? Um, only this, see, I was, uh, I was state uh, Democratic chairman uh, from 68 to uh, 71 or long in there. Mm -hmm. So I was, uh, I resigned as, uh, the, as the legislative chairman mm -hmm. at that time, but I was still active because Governor Smith signed one bill, 160, mm -hmm. which uh, gave you $150,000, I believe it was, plus an enabling act that you got, which uh, uh, advised the university and college board, which was under the coordinating board, right, right. to uh, provide education for osteopathic medical students. Mm -hmm. Uh, you well remember that, and wasn't that uh, based on like about fifty-five hundred dollars per student, something like that. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, then seventy-one to seventy-two, we'll just go another year further. Right, seventy-two right. was really the big time. Well, the big time was when you got the enabling legislation under Bill Senate Bill one hundred and sixty, right. as Governor Smith signed. That's right. That was and, that and then about uh, the sixteenth of May, nineteen seventy-one. Because you got the enabling legislation to provide education for osteopathic uh, students. Right. 71 and 2 is when you got $350,000, I believe, plus you got $3.5 million for construction of a building, mm -hmm. see? Mm -hmm. So uh, then, uh, then it moved on until 75 when Briscoe signed uh, Senate Bill, wasn't it, or House Bill 260? Oh. House Bill, wasn't it? Uh, no, it was Senate Bill. Senate Bill 260. Two, uh, two, Six, two, 61. 261. Senate Bill 261. Yeah. Uh, that was uh, Senate uh, Betty Angahar was responsible yeah. and, for that. And, and Gib Lewis. And Gib Lewis, very much yes, so. And he yes. represented it in the House. Yeah. She, uh, she carried the political ball, so to speak, in the Senate. Uh, so, that, you see, uh, we, so you see, we had lots of friends by that time. Mm -hmm. But we really started getting them in the 50s, like I said earlier. Yeah, right. We really started getting them in the 50s, and, uh, and once we got those scholarships, well, we just had it made. And I think you were the first employee about well, 1967 I'm, I'm, or 8. I'm gratefully proud of that, I really Thinking, am. Weren't yeah, you? Absolutely. Yes, that's what, sir. That's what I was thinking, yeah, yes. Right. Yeah. Well, I'm not going to let you get out off the hook that easy now, because I know that you had a little bit more involvement in some of these closed-door sessions that they had at various committees. Now, we had a, had a senator, what was his name, from uh, Galveston, uh, who was very instrumental. He was, he was kind of a, uh, uh, in other words, he was a deterrent for a while, but he finally became Swartz. a booster. You mean Swartz? Yes, uh, Babe Swartz. Yeah. Babe Swartz. He, he wasn't a, a, a very strong advocate. But he was finally sold a bill of goods. Now, somebody had something to do with selling him uh, the, the profession and the possibility of our school. Well, I think there's quite a few folks uh, dealt with him on that because he was a hard person to sell because he represented uh, 
a medical school unit in Galveston, right? You know? Right. Mm -hmm. So uh, yes, he did come around, and he's he's still. I see him every once in a while yet, and he's still real happy about it. You know, yeah, right. about the college. You, has and he ever so, been to Fort Worth to see the campus? I wonder. Uh, I think he has. I think he told me he has. And Tom Creighton, Senator Creighton, you know, from Mental Wells. Well, absolutely. We don't want to overlook him. We had lots of friends. Lots of friends. Absolutely. But uh, at one time, we didn't have so many friends in Senate. At one time, I remember way back, where I'm digressing now, uh -huh. going way back, we get to Dr. Russell and Dr. Wilson, Peterson, and uh, Sparks down here. We were taking care of the legislative work. We'd have trouble to talk to talking to more than two or three senators, you know, that would talk to us. Right. See? And that's how things change, you know. Well, now you just mentioned some names <laughs> that I relate to, with one exception. Who was Dr. Wilson? Oh, Ever Wilson was a pillar in the profession. He was on the medical board for I don't know how many years. I, I know when you said Everett Wilson, that brings yeah. a bell, but I didn't. And when you, you know, he said passed that. away just recently. You know, right. just about right. a month. I lost track of him. Yeah. You mentioned he, he, Sam Sparks. He oh was, yeah, right. Sam was good. Oh, he right. was good. Right. Sam know how. To, Sam knew how to move. You know, mm -hmm. we'd go up here to the Capitol, and Sam just knew how to move in the Capitol. And his wife, Merrill, yeah, Merrill, fine, also, fine lady. Right, right. In fact, the matter she's probably one reason I came down here. You know, she came to Kansas City, and took some of the students out to eat. She did. Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, were you one of the fortunate? Yeah, yes. <laughs> See. And she took us out to eat and told us about all the nice things, and she was a real charming lady. Right. You know? mm -hmm. right. That had been a long time ago. Yeah. Now then, let's uh, let's get back on this uh, uh, Senate Bill 160. Well, 160, that's when we became involved with the legislature and the coordinating board. And then Senate Bill 2 261 uh, was when we became a part of the state system. Now. Uh, and of course, uh, Dr. Uh, Briscoe was uh, not doctor, but Governor Briscoe mm -hmm. was was presiding officer at that time in state government, and he signed the bill. I believe what was it about this almost uh, corresponding date a few years later, about, I believe it's May the mm -hmm. 17th, 1975, mm -hmm. that made us part of the state system. Mm -hmm. Now, what uh, what involvement do you have in that? In the background. In the background, uh, you had other people. You didn't really need much involvement in those days because it was just things were just falling into place. You know, mm -hmm. uh, it was all done with. You know, it was all done when we got the scholarship. First scholarship was all done with. It's just a matter of of, of developments, and uh, the same with that because it was just routine, just by voice vote. You know, it was well, now uh, you said uh, everything fell in place, and I'm sure that's true. But I know you had some opposition. You want, uh, and here and again, I'm not trying to embarrass you or anybody else. But did we have any opposition uh, that's worth being recorded, uh, as far as historical facts are concerned? Uh, any particular personage or anyone that uh, was so outspoken that they ought to be remembered for that, if nothing else? Well, there was a few voices, but I don't think it was any of any uh, real have any real depth about it because uh -huh. uh, it was a foregone conclusion that this uh, this was going to take place mm -hmm. and in fact the matter had already had taken place back in 1971 yeah right, it right. already taken place and, and we kind of passed over that but didn't we base that particular bill 160 wasn't that pretty well based upon uh, its predecessor, what was known as the Baylor Bill, yes. passed in 1969. Yeah. It did That's the right. same thing for another private mm -hmm. school mm -hmm. uh, that they were doing for TCOM. Mm -hmm. Basically, I think there was just a change of yeah. a few names and, and so on. That's correct. Uh, some members of the legislature, I think, uh, probably originated that even, because they said, let's use that as just a, as, as a parallel bill. Mm -hmm. and, and that's essentially what, what came out of it. You know, we had a friend at TCOM that's kind of gone un, unnoticed because he'd been out of politics now for a number of years, but his father and I were very close friends, and during a little small tenure that I had in attempted politics in 1950, uh, I, I became acquainted with Salty Hull. You probably knew Salty oh, yeah, Hull. Oh, yeah, yeah, Well, now yeah. Cordell Hull yeah. was his son, and Cordell yeah. was very important. Yeah, yeah. He was very influential yeah. in helping us. Uh, yeah. get where we are today, yeah. really, but nobody's given him very much credit because yeah. he's not he's around, but I mean he's not in politics. Salty Hall was back there in the 40s, you know. Right, right. Salty, Salty was a good friend of mine. Yeah, and then Cordell, his boy, he's down here 
down here in Austin most of the time now, I think. I see him down here a lot. Do you? Well, I've been He's trying a great to big, tall him. boy, just yeah, like your right. dad was. A absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. He, he certainly yeah, is. Yeah, he's, and he's sure, he's just, just like his dad. He's just, yeah. just so cordial all the time. Nice person. And don't you feel like he had some... Oh, yes. Oh, at least yes. a little finger in, oh. the, in the hand that you made know, it possible? A lot of people, you know, had had a part in it, you know, and uh, it's it's hard to give credit. But you know, we've got to go back to this. We got to give credit to the DOs, the treated people, the treated people. Uh, they treated, uh, you know, they would they would treat them, and then pretty soon they would be their total physician. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? They'd get them for because they were different. Uh, they'd come to them in the early days. Nowadays, of course, it don't make a difference. You know, these uh, boys today, they have no problems going to any. Any uh, any teaching uh, area or any uh, medical facility or anything else, you know, right. uh, compared to what we we had to battle it, and we had to battle it all the way. But now, uh, their main battle now is economics. That's our that's our only that's their only problem. You know, before we conclude this chat together, I want to touch on something that uh, you may be a little embarrassed or a little modest about. But you know, TCOM now is comprised of better than 15 acres of land, and we have three tremendous buildings, uh, mm -hmm. large buildings, an eight-story, a five-story, and a four-story building. I'm in part of the four-story. My office is on the third floor of the library building, which is called Med-Ed 3, the most recent building, and it cost right at $11 million. Now, uh, and uh, we uh, had that money kicked around from, uh, pillar to post for a long time before we absolutely got it for certain uh, and I've been told and I'd like for you to kind of verify the story that I uh, that I've been told that Elmer Baum had a lot to do with our actually getting that 11 million dollars uh, can you give me a little bit of uh, uh, your your involvement in uh, you know we were granted uh, and it passed by the legislature mm -hmm. now this was all what back about 1980 three or four, somewhere yeah, in there, three or uh, four. and uh, Dr., uh, not Dr., but uh, Governor Clements, uh, the governor, Yeah. Uh, he was going to line be towards, I understand, uh, the money that was allocated for TCOM's library building until certain people helped change his mind. I don't I mean, know who changed his mind, but uh, Dr. Luba called me mm -hmm. one late, late one afternoon. He told me just exactly what you said, that he, he understood that uh, Governor Clements had vetoed or was going to veto the appropriation for the library. And uh, I wanted to know if, I, if I'd help out. And I says, yeah, I'll, I'll see what I can do, George. So I, I called the governor's office. That was about four or five o'clock, I guess, called him. And um, he couldn't come to the phone because uh, his administrative assistant said he was working on the appropriation bill. And he said, I want to know what uh, it's calling about. And I said, well, I'm calling about the library for the Fort Worth Osteopathic uh, Medical College. And I understand we've got a problem. He says, well, I think he's passed over that, which uh, I kind of thought maybe that uh, he'd probably had vetoed, you know, or wasn't going to assign. Mm -hmm. And I said, he was, I couldn't talk to him because he's busy. So I said, will you write this down, this message down? Uh, you're going to be doing, if he, if he doesn't sign that bill, appropriation bill, uh, that he's going to be doing a big injustice to a big segment of people and to a school of medicine that just barely got off the ground and they don't have the, don't have the proper library. All other medical schools have their library. This is a must that he should sign that bill because uh, it's, it's needed and uh, it's uh, justifiable. And tell him, tell him this that I'm going to be real unhappy. Plus, many, many other folks can be unhappy about it because you're stifling the progress of, the, of a medical school that's just getting off its feet. Mm -hmm. And whoever changed changed the situation, I don't know. But anyway, I'll let him know how I felt about it. Uh, and I did that for through George Lubel. Mm -hmm. Well, it must have been effective because we've got the building and we're in it and been in it now for several years and it's a grand, it's a, it's a grand credit. It's one of the finest, I'm being a little prejudiced naturally, but uh, as I've been told, it's one of the finest medical libraries anywhere you'll find in the country. It's a beautiful building. You remember I, John Burnett and I were up there, you know, and you gave us that tour. It's a beautiful building. 
and I'm sure that Governor Clements would be real proud of it now, and he probably he probably is. Yeah, right. But anyway, uh, you ought to bring him up and show it to him. Sometime. Yeah, you ought to did, do did that. tell him about it. Yeah, right. And uh, but anyway, um, uh, you got the library, and I didn't know that it was in jeopardy. You know, right? Because he was uh, he was vetoing a lot of things because they were short of money. Right, right. You know, before we conclude this uh, chat together, I, I want to close on this note. I know you've made a great contribution here in Austin and the state and the nation. And I say nation because I noticed that every now and then I call down here to talk to Elmer Baum and he's on his way or, or just been to or just got back from Washington. Uh, wh what uh, takes you to Washington occasionally? Well, I've been on the Council on Federal Health Programs. You know, that's a committee that deals with federal legislation. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess about 25, 30 years. And I was chairman of it until just a few years ago. And we uh, we have meet up there about four or five times a year. Uh -huh. uh, as you know, there's a lot of federal legislation nowadays that uh, the doctors are unhappy about that's uh, taking place <laughs> right. up there. Right. So you're very active in that. You're still involved in that. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, Dr. Elmer, it certainly has been a, a distinguished pleasure to visit with you here in the confines of your, your office here in the great city, capital city of Austin. And you know the welcome mat's always out. Anytime you're in Fort Worth, oh, TCOM, we want you to come by. It's a pleasure to get to visit with you today. Well, you've always, taken, is, you've always taken good care of me. This there. is Ray Stokes in Dr. Elmer Baum's office on the 5th of October, 1989.